Hi, I'm Chris Hague and this is the Fiddle Channel and today I'm going to give you three versions of Bonaparte's Retreat. I'm not sure which it is. When I started researching it I realised there are a lot of possible origins for this tune and a lot of different versions. So I'm going to give you a standard tuning version uh, which I learned from Ali Bain um, when he recorded it with the Transatlantic Sessions. I'm going to give you the Benny Thomason version um, and I'm going to give you the William Stepp version which ended up as a Copeland version. Um, and the latter two I'm going to do in um, GDAD open tuning. So where is it from? Uh, it's, it's named after the retreat of Napoleon's army from Russia and it's said possibly that it was um, written by musicians in the Irish brigades which served in Napoleon's army. Uh, they've been there for uh, a long time, several hundred years I think, since the flight of the wild geese when the um, Irish nobility um, left Ireland in a hurry. Um, so they went to France and joined the army. Um, some people say this is an American tune and I think it's most likely more commonly played there than it is over here. Uh, but it is certainly well known everywhere. Uh, so we'll start off with the Ali Bain version, which is the slowest version. And if you think of a retreating army, I think this particular retreating army would not have been gaily galloping <laughs> over the steps. I think they would have been trudging in the snow. So in that sense, I think this is the more appropriate one. Uh, so we're in standard tuning, and um, it's quite slow. One, two, three... <coughs> So, several interesting features to this. Um, the arrangement of bars is slightly random, um, particularly at the end. But anyway, uh, so we start off with uh, hammer on, and there's quite a few hammer ons, and an A drone at the bottom if you want. That's a little double 
cut. Another hammer on. Another double cut. Now these are extra bars and they happen quite often. Um, and if you do that, add that little second finger. Or then you add a, a kind of a bagpipe thing. And uh, actually, another version of where this story came from is that it was improvised by a Scottish bagpiper at the Battle of Waterloo. But that sounds a little bit random to me, so I'm not sure I believe that. Um, next section. And you can put an F sharp under there if you want to emphasize the D chord or just a D drone. Again, those double notes. Then we're going up. And here we've got an A chord and um, uh, you definitely want an A drone under there. You could put a C sharp under there if you wanted. Uh, the, the, what I call the bluegrass double stop, third position with an A underneath it like that. That's quite nice. And here's a half a bar. And that half a bar only happens the first time, not on the repeat. Uh, I saw a Bruce Molsky version which was much more crooked than this, uh, so I think the more uh, serious and old timey play you are, <laughs> the more bits of bar you're going to take out and put in. Um, so let's play this one through uh, with the backing, then we'll move on to the detuning versions. <clears throat> To the Benny Thomason version. Uh, you can see um, videos of him playing this and when you do so uh, you, you realize how similar it is 
to uh, Midnight on the Water, which was written by his dad, and um, in the same tuning, and I do wonder whether or not uh, he wrote Midnight on the Water immediately after having played this. Um, the two are, uh, it's, de it's definitely not copied the tune, but it's definitely copied the feel of the tune. Uh, so, um, we're going to detune to D dad tuning, which means the G goes a long way down to D, D stays the same, A stays the same, E comes down a tone to D. And fortunately I have another fiddle which I have already tuned. So the tuning that we've got is a low D, normal D, normal A, and a low E taken down to D. The hardest part of this uh, tuning is dealing with that low G. You've got to play soft, because as soon as you play hard on that bottom string, and it goes sharp. Um, and uh, it's almost always used just as a drone, so we're going to play basically most of the melody on standard fingering, standard tuning. When you get onto the E string, then it's as if we've missed a note out. If you're not used to uh, open tunings, as indeed I'm not, then I think the best thing is to make sure you know the tune before you start it. So perhaps learn it initially uh, in standard tuning. Um, and then it won't be too difficult. The main problem is on the, uh, when you're changing from the A string to the E string. That's the only real problem that you have. Um, but anyway, let's go into the, the first part is easy. So we're going to have a G drone through all the way through this, or a, a D note drone. And you'll notice we're at a considerably uh, more sprightly speed than we were before. Um, these are uh, either very frightened or very well fed and fit horses that are galloping over the Russian steppe. Um, second part, now your fingers want to go, but that doesn't work. So we start on the E string. Here we have those extra bars again, or that, that extra bar. Repeat that. Then, um, next part onto the E string with the second finger. Try the whole thing uh, with the backing.
Now we move on to the version by William Stepp. He was a Kentucky fiddler and his version was recorded by Alan Lomax um, sometime ago, I can't remember when, 30s or 40s maybe. And um, a transcription appeared in the Library of Congress and Aaron Copeland uh, saw this uh, transcription and he used that in his Rodeo uh, and made it a very famous piece. And there's been quite a lot of debate as to whether this was downright theft. Um, almost certainly Copeland didn't realise that this wasn't just a traditional tune um, and that it was a very particular step version. But on the other hand, William Stepp, he may well have played it differently every time anyway. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't really his composition. Um, but anyway, it's a very famous version. And it's a very fast, it's kind of a hold-down tempo. Um, some people, uh, Mark O'Connor for example, plays this, starts it slowly and speeds up. Uh, which you might do if you're a retreating army, possibly. Um, and, um, but we're going to play it at a steady tempo. It's got a more pentatonic sound, particularly to the A section, and I suspect that's why Copeland liked it so much. And there's a real galloping feel to the B section. But let's go through it slowly. So the A section is a mixture of the lower two strings and the E, so you've got to watch out. You can play it standard apart from the... that bit in the third bar. Then we've got a, a rocking up and down. So you can do that either with the upper A drone or the lower D drone, and I think it should be the lower one. Then we're onto the E string with a second finger. So basically this is exactly the same as the previous line but up an octave and we're now using the lower A drone. And then a slight variation where we go in with the fourth finger. So let's try the whole thing. Um, and I'll keep it steady, I'll keep it steady all the way through. Now there's various ways of doing different repeats and you can extend sections or whatever. I think uh, probably what William Stepp did was basically just uh, kind of improvise and um, double or lengthen sections wherever he felt like it. Anyway, let's play this uh, version with the backing. This is a quite fascinating tune with many twists and turns to its story. I don't know whether you should learn all three versions or whether you should decide which is the one for you and stick with that. 
But anyway, uh, I can send you a copy of all three versions if you subscribe, send me an email um, and I'll send that to you. And I will see you again soon.